Greetings all. Here is my, let's see if I get close, 17 minute video on stermina piles and more broadly, SAR. Shockingly, I have some slides. And the slides are always posted in our folder. So if you wanna click a link, they'll be there. I really hope to do three things in this little mini lecture. Um, one is to give some background on SAR. A little, the second is to talk about the diversity within SAR. And finally, to talk about stermina piles, the alveolates and rhizaria are gonna come up in future lectures. So I made the point before that most eukaryotes are microbial. Here's a foram, here's a ciliate. Here's my lab from a few years ago. Um, we're not my, microbial, well, we used to be microbial. Anyway, most eukaryotes are microbial, and the big question is how is it organized? And when we all read the 2012 uh, review paper that I wrote, you saw this file, excuse me, this phylogeny, which had all of these groups, the major clades you pre presented, and this is the group SAR that we're gonna be discussing in the next few minutes. And I would argue to you SAR is about three-fifths of known eukaryotic diversity. Embarrassing to get the hiccups during mini lecture, but there it is. So who are the SAR? SAR? You probably know by now, there's stermina piles, alveolates, and rhizaria, and we're gonna dig a little bit today again into stermina piles. Then you might ask, well, what are, what's the synapomorphy for SAR? Well, stermina piles have a synapomorphy, and I'll say a word about that in a few minutes. It's stermina piles, it means hay, like they have two flagella, most eukaryotes do, and one of their flagella has little fur on it. So that's the um, synapomorphy for stermina piles is having the second hairy flagellum. As we learned in our major clade presentations, alveolates have these alveoli, which are these sacs that are used to form the plates in dinoflagellates, for example, and are part of this, the outer uh, cell structures of ciliates. We'll talk about them, I think, in the coming days. And the synapomor, so all alveolates have alveoli, alveolar sacs. And the synapomorphy for rhizaria is, we don't know. And uh, the synapomorphy for SAR is, we don't know. So basically this group is emerged by analyses of molecular phylogeny. My read of the data is that SAR is a robust group that is likely to withstand the addition of additional data, but there is no synapomorphy for this group. And one of the things I wanna show you is how the game is played in most of the world. So I was actually part of this project called the Open Tree of Life. And they went through and tried to collect, it's actually pretty cool, you can Google it, I'll show the icon in a minute. They collected every one of the two million binomial names, Homo sapiens, Escherichiae coli, um, two million species names, genus and species that are out there and put them into a taxonomic database. So here's the little icon and, and I was a co-PI co on this project, but I'm afraid I lost to represent the microbes and you'll see that in a minute. So the, the main figure of our paper is this one right here. And if you take a look, um, what you will see is, oh, I'll just make my little face go away, there we go. What you will see is that most of the, here are bacteria, there's hardly any archaea, and here are all the eukaryotes, and most eukaryotes are, shockingly, da -da -da, metazoa, and fungi and archaeoplastida. And I'm telling you that SAR is two thirds of the diversity of eukaryotes, but they represent about the same amount of all archaea, which are also underrepresented. And it turns out, so you might ask, are two thirds of eukaryotes epistocons? No, it's just that the criteria, criteria that they had here to clean were applicable only for animals, for metazoa, sorry, metazoa is another word for animals, but not for SAR. So for example, to make it in this tree, you have to have molecular data and meet some level of criteria for the quality of data. So you're reading about how SAR have you molecular data. So we wanted to address this. So here are all eukaryotes. This says most eukaryotes are, are plants, animals, and fungi. We wanted to address this really just by looking at SAR. And so in the Groton Hodge paper that you, many of you have read, we did the same approach, but we focused on SAR. We estimate there's 60,000 names, 61,000 names. Actually, we took them from the original Tree of Life Open Tree uh, database, 61,000 names. But we also went on to do a bunch of things where we considered 
starting with binomial names. This one is obviously strombidium resil zadiganae, strombidium mobilobulin, strombidium phallix, et cetera. And we really thought about these different ranks, which isn't so important for today. But in the end, in the paper that you read, we look, about, look at these 61,000 species and each line that shows up here, if they're more than 200 species, it's a warmer color and the fewer species, the colder the color. And we divided this into Rhizaria, Stramina piles, and alveolates. Um, there's 11,000 named Rhizaria, 17,000 named alveolates, 31,000 named Stramina piles. And when we map them out here, this is what we see. Interestingly, FO, these are the forams. Look how many forams there are. We'll return to these in a later lecture. These guys have a fossil record, which might be why there's so many binomial names. Dinoflagellates, this is AP complexins where malaria is. We'll return to these. Ciliates, the most beloved group. Here are the diatoms that I'll talk about today. BA for Bacillia phyta. So anyway, this is what we did. We said, no, actually there's 61,000 binomially named SAR, that's a lot. And then um, we went through to dissect that. But I won't say anything more about that. Instead, I wanna turn and drill down just into the S of Stramina piles. So that of the S of SAR, which is Stramina piles. So I'll spend, we'll see some number of minutes talking about Stramina piles. Who are they? First off, the root of Stramino, as I said before, Stramino means straw hairs. And this is because of the presence of these hair-like structures on the flagella of many of the stramina piles. This feature has been lost in some, but is inferred to be a synapomorphy. And so here are some SEMs of these flagella. Here's a, a stramina pile with two flagella. One is smooth and one is hairy. And here's an up-close cross-section of these hairy flagella. Stramina pile, straw hairs, hairy flagella. The other word for stramina piles you'll see in the literature is heterocont, different flagella. There are many members, I'll show them to you in a minute, but I would say key members to know are the oomycetes, which I'll talk about for Irish potato famine, Phytophthora here. The slime nets I'll talk about first just because they're cool. And then there's many, many, many photosynthetic stramina piles. And I represent just two here, the brown algae that are kelp forests where we see sea otters, um, feeding and diatoms, which I'll say some words about. So here is a phylogeny of stramina piles. These are all stramina piles. These are outgroups here. So C and D are stramina piles. It's not that important. Some of you care about blastocystis, so I stuck the name on there. It's the only one that might be a human pathogen. I'm going to return to this in a little bit, but black means photosynthetic and white means not photosynthetic. Um, and I'm going to start by telling you just a few words about the, some of these groups. I'll start with the labyrinthalids. So labyrinthalids, ecologically, they're parasites or they're saprotrophic. So saprotrophic means that you eat dead things. And I um, think you might be uncomfortable to know that, in fact, humans are largely saprotrophic. When you go to the grocery store to buy carrots or, um, or, or your hamburger, those things are now deceased and that's what we eat. Okay, you didn't wanna know that. So these things are parasitic or they, they eat living things or they eat dead things. They're, so they're basically live off other things. They are often found on marine organisms, including mollusks, but more importantly, aquatic plants. Um, and in the 1950s, I think again in the 70s, the, this organism called labyrinthalid basically ate all the eelgrass, destroyed all the eelgrass in marine environments, which killed all the clams and mussels, which had a big impact on the animals, the larger animals above in the food chain. So this is an eelgrass bed. This is eelgrass, and these things are really important for diversity of animals, uh, waterfowl overwintering, and they also prevent erosion, but they were destroyed by these labyrinthalids. What are the labyrinthalids? I'll post a video of these, but they literally make an ectoplasmic net. So if you haven't watched Ghostbusters, you should, because you can hear the word ectoplasmic there as well. So ectoplasmic outside of their own cytoplasm. They basically cover themselves with little thin scales, and then they build a highway of slimy nets that they travel through. So here is a picture of this network. So this is what it looks like in a light microscope. These are each individual amoeba with their nuclei, but can you see the threads here? And here is a blow up of these threads. 
So these are amoeba. They excrete the ectoplasmic net, the little threads, and then the amoeba push and shove their way through this highway. Here are just some pictures. There are many kinds of labyrinthoid. Some of them make these external networks, but the one I'm telling you about labyrinthoid makes a network and then the individual amoeba slide through. Um, there are many other kinds of stromenopiles, I think I have the tree coming in a minute, that people have referred to as pseudofungi, fake fungi. And here are two examples. I'll say very little about the hyphochytrids, but I'll spend a little bit more time on the oomyces. I just want you to know how crazy biology is. There's a group called hyphochytromycetes, so people thought they were fungi. They occur everywhere, soil, freshwater, marine. They also are parasites or saprobes and they eat algae or fungi. And here's what they look like. I'd say these organisms are very poorly studied, but people initially thought they were just weird fungi, but they turn out to be in the Stermina pile land. Um, and here's a picture of another one of these. So they have phallus and they basically form these slimy little networks. But I really wanna spend a few more minutes on the oomycetes. So the oomycetes are the, include the causative agent of Irish potato famine. Um, and the most famous genus is Phytophthora. Phytophthora includes important plant pathogens, including Phytophthora infestans, which is the causative agent of the Irish potato famine. But today, if you're an agriculturalist or a horticulturalist, you will not mail your plants around or ship them across uh, country because people will be concerned about the Phytophthora that you might be um, moving with your plants. So there's regulations on the distribution of plants because of this parasite. Phytophthora, this is a plant here, you probably recognize that, but the rest of these images are the Phytophthora. So we can start with an oospore. I'm never going to test you on these details. It grows into this little fruiting body structure. And inside this fruiting body structure, you get a single cell that has many little nuclei. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And then these nuclei go rapidly through um, mitosis to here are these little biflagellate cells and one flagellate would have little hairs on it. And these cells can go on to infect the roots or the leaves or the potato fruit. And basically these things will parasitize on the host that they're on. I think this sort of splice and dice multiple mitosis, which you saw before with malaria is pretty cool. So I'm going to draw it out for you in a quick video. I think it's a 30 second video, but the little zoospores you're going to see, they have the two distinct flagella. So let's take a quick look and what you're going to see in this video when it opens up is just the discharge of the zoospores. And so there's an, oops, hold on little thing. Look, it's only 30 seconds. I'll go backwards. So we're going to see it, this gigantic cell that has many nuclei and then the gigantic cell with many nuclei bursts forth and gives rise to hundreds of little cells, each with its own nucleus. And then they simply swim away. I think this video is so important because it gives you a sense of why a disease like the Irish potato famine might have spread so well. These um, things are, can be environmentally resistant to heat and then they get in the right environment and they break forth and all these little babies pop out to cause um, troubles in there in, you know, for the plant. So I, um, I was in Dublin last year at an, an, an amoeba meeting, obviously, um, and I got to see this incredibly powerful sculpture of people coming into the city during the Irish potato famine. The Irish potato famine dates from about 1845 to 1850 and nearly a million people died, more than three quarters of a million people died. And mostly it was poor, which shows the intersection between class and um, mass outbreaks. Um, and it was because the poor people in Ireland at the time depended on the potatoes as a big government angle about the British government and its role in supporting or not the, the outcomes of these impoverished people. And nearly 2 million people emigrated to the US at that time and other countries as well. Um, and, and that's quite interesting period of time. And the big punchline for our class is that this Phytophthora infestans like potatoes. So potatoes are a new world crop. 
they came from the new world and this P in festins, when it got to Europe, it had no known checks and balances. And so this parasite took over and destroyed potato crops, which had become the base of um, the food sources for um, farmers in Ireland, in Laura's poor history. So we'll watch a two minute video on the history of the Irish potato famine. And maybe we'll learn a bit more. The Irish potato famine struck in 1845 and lasted nearly six years. It not only destroyed a vital crop, but it also killed more than a million people and exposed the social and economic problems facing 19th century Ireland. A mysterious fungus destroyed the potato harvest on a scale not seen before, but the government's inadequate response only made the crisis worse. During the entire famine, British officials never provided massive food aid to Ireland for fear that the constant changes in food prices would unfairly harm English landowners. In addition, poorly organized private relief efforts failed to raise funds from donors. The Irish didn't help their cause either. Farmers who needed cash to avoid eviction exported locally grown wheat and other food staples that could have fed their starving people. As the famine went on, the situation grew more desperate. To avoid mass starvation, the Irish lived off everything from seaweed to grass. Many pawned all they owned to buy what little food they could afford. After the harsh winter of 1846, food riots erupted and the British sent in troops to stop the unrest. To save their estates from ruin, landlords evicted the poor farmers, forcing them to migrate to Canada on poorly built, overcrowded vessels that became known as coffin ships. The Canadian reception facilities at Gross Isle at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River were woefully inadequate to handle the massive influx of immigrants. Of the 100,000 Irish who sailed to Canada in 1847, an estimated one out of five died from disease and malnutrition. About half the survivors crossed the border and began new lives in the United States. The potato famine had a devastating effect on Ireland and led to a permanent reorganization of the nation's agriculture and land use. So obviously that is only one version of what happened in Irish potato famine and one that fit in my time frame for a video to show you and you won't be surprised to learn that it was uh, paid for from the Canadian public broadcast. Um, but what I think is really most important for our story is the role of a microbe and in this case a microbial eukaryote in shaping the history, at least one angle of history. So I think I have a few more slides to share and then I will be done for the day. Oops, come back here. Oh no, don't do that. Um, and so if we get back into the slides, um, I told you a little bit about some of these early branching non-photosynthetic stramina piles and um, I had a few highlights and I wanna to turn to the photosynthetic ones but I wanted to draw this to your attention. First off, these are stramina tiles from Blastocystis over. Um, Blastocystis is not photosynthetic. The relationships at the deeper nodes here are controversial, but if I told you the earliest diverging stramina piles, the next earliest diverging, and the next earliest diverging lineages were not photosynthetic, you have two possibilities. One is that photosynthesis was present in the last common ancestor of stramina piles, which is what the, the chrome alveolate hypothesis would argue. I show you this tree to suggest the possibility that in fact, chloroplasts were re acquired once more recently within stramina piles um, and were never present in these lineages. I'm not saying which is correct, I'm saying they're alternatives. Chrome alveolate says there was a plastid here and everybody lost it, certainly possible. My, an alternative is that plastids were gained here. And here, just to pull out, are where the heteroconsonous stramina piles sit in this uh, Larkham article that we read. Basically, here the heteroconsonous include these diverse uh, 
uh, pigments and are argued to be secondary, but how many secondaries we don't know. And oddly, the stermina piles keep their chloroplasts in their rough endoplasmic reticulum. Why? I have no idea. I'm going to end by talking a little bit about diatoms because I love diatoms. Here's their the longer name, formal name, Vasolariophyta. And diatoms are beautiful. Diatoms are important. Uh, here they are. They can be overall people describe them as uh, pennate and these round ones or thecate, these more pokey ones. They can be multicellularity. They do everything but drive a truck. And gardeners use diatoms, they use diatomaceous earth because diatoms are made of glass. And if you garden and you put little glass shards around your plants, the worms won't grow, crawl through them. Now here, I'll put my face back on there. So diatoms are among the most important and abundant components of marine phytoplankton. The reason, among the reasons I love them is that they live in a glass box. These glass box are called two valves or frustules, but it's not really important. They have an upper valve and a lower valve with all of these names that people use for taxonomy. Um, here's another picture of a pennate one, and you have an upper valve and a lower valve, and then the cell lives inside this glass box. They can be single-celled or colonial. They can be of a variety of colors, and they largely lack flagella, except if you watch in those movies, you can see their brief sexual phases when they pop out of their glass boxes as cells with flagella. So here are pennate guys, and I showed you um, some of the centrics in another picture. So just because I love them so much, here's a scanning electron micrograph of this glass box. So here is the upper, here's the, the sort of place where the shoe box closes. So you have one valve, one shoe box part, and the other, and these, all these terms, gir including girdle, that are used to describe these different species. There are 30,000 named species or 20,000 named species of, diatom of diatoms. Diatoms spend most of the year dividing asexually, as many microbial eukaryotes do. What's cool about them is they have this, they live in the glass box, and when they're going to divide, the glass box breaks open and each one makes a new inner. So the top of the glass box makes a new inner that's exactly the same size as the original box, but the bottom of the box makes a new inner that's smaller. And what this means is during the course of the season, when you have these glass boxes, Here's, sorry, here's the starting glass box. Sometimes they give birth to daughter cells their own size, but sometimes they give birth to daughter cells that shrink in size. And the result of this is that over the course of a season, half of the population stays the same size and half of the population is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. At the end of a season, they pop out, they swim around with their flagella, they have sex, and then they reset their size. So the end of the result I want you to know about diatoms, people claim they do 25% of all carbon fixation. I think if you counted, everybody likes their group to be important, so I would give a big grain of salt to that. Um, but they are major oxygen producers. They're a major food source in, for aquatic organisms. They're really important for um, geology. And if you watch the video I posted, you saw somebody flying over diatoms in a helicopter. They're also commercially important for things like filters and they're even present in some toothpaste as abrasives. So what I hope I did today was give you a little bit of background on this group SAR and a little bit more detail into this incredibly diverse and cool group called Stermina piles. And I believe that is all I have for you for today. Take care all.